Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. My name is Lucy Walton. My co-host is Jeffrey Ha. Um, we are both honoured to be here today on behalf of Western Sydney University Library. Uh, today we are excited to launch the latest title from Western Open Books, Africa's Knowledge Bridge, Empowering Global Access to Research Resources in a COVID World. This book delves into the pandemic's impact on sub-Saharan Africa, offering critical insights and recommendations for future public health strategies. In addition to celebrating this significant publication, we will have the privilege of hearing from a distinguished panel of experts and authors who will be discussing the pandemic's impact on sub-Saharan Africa. They will provide unique in insights and evidence-based recommendations that highlight the crucial role of research resources in this challenging time. Thank you all for joining us for this important event. As we start today's session, it's important that we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. To lead us in this important tradition, I'm honoured to introduce Professor Auntie Kerry Doyle, a proud Winninini woman from Darkin Jung country and a respected scholar in Indigenous health, including migrants. Professor Doyle has graciously agreed to deliver the acknowledgement of country. We are privileged to have Professor Doyle with us today to share her knowledge and to honour the enduring connection of Indigenous peoples to the land. Please join me in welcoming Professor Auntie Kerry Doyle. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So, Dr. Auntie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Aboriginal people, especially from the north part of Australia, Maureen's waving. Are you right, Maureen? You're just waving. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> we, believe, we believe that we have had a long and fruitful relationship with the people from Africa. For example, in my language, the word for hello is jamu, and I know that that's similar in a lot of African languages considering also the Bradford paintings, which look very African. And how did the Baobab tree get to Australia? Well, that's another question. So we acknowledge that the countries that we come from and the countries that we live on, work on and walk on are really all connected. The earth is our mother and she knows our footprints of each and every one of us. And in the acknowledgement of the country where I come from, which is, you know, Beninini, um, Woodgery and Cadigal as well, then, and Irish and probably something else as well, then we recognise that we are all equal under the sun. And it's just a privilege to be here with this austere group of scholars and individuals. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Auntie Kerry. Now, let's look at today's agenda. We have an exciting and informative program planned, starting with a warm welcome and opening remarks from the library. Next, we will highlight the significance of this event, setting the stage for what is to come. Then we'll move into the story behind the creation of Africa's Knowledge Bridge. We're honoured to have keynote presentations from distinguished guest speakers, after which we will, we will engage in enriching panel discussions with authors and experts, who will share their insights and recommendations. There will be an opportunity for Q&A sessions at the end, where you can engage directly with our speakers and authors. I'd ask that you reserve any questions for the Q&A session or add them to the chat. And finally, we will conclude the session with closing remarks and a link to how you can access Africa's Knowledge Bridge. We are delighted to have you with us today and look forward to an engaging and insightful event. It's been my pleasure yeah. to introduce our two guest speakers, yes. Fiona yes. Salisbury, Executive, Executive Director, Director Library Services, Services, and, and Lucy Walton, Walton scholarly, scholarly publishing, publishing consultant, consultant, who are both at Western, Western Sydney University, University Australia. Australia. Fiona has been instrumental in advancing the library's mission to support open research and learning within our community. Fiona will be welcoming you to this session and introducing you to the Western Open Books Service, which plays a pivotal role in making educational content and research more openly accessible, empowering global knowledge sharing and support to achieve the University's Sustainable Development Goals. 
Lucy, who coordinates and manages the Western Open Books projects, will provide valuable insights into what it took for the library to publish Africa's Knowledge Bridge as an open book. Please join me in welcoming Fiona Salisbury and Lucy Walton. Thanks very much, Jeff, and hello, everybody, and thank you for coming today and welcome. It's really great to see so many people here to launch Africa's Knowledge Bridge. The library is very excited to have been involved in um, publishing this book, and it's been a privilege to support the authors to publish this work with Western Open Books. As Lucy said, we've got a very full agenda today to talk about this important book. But to start with, I'd just like to say a few things about the benefits of open book publishing. Open book publishing at Western Sydney University is part of a wider growing interest in open textbooks in the Australian higher education sector. And the Council of Australian University Librarians has been leading an initiative called the Open Educational Resources Collective, which has members from 42 universities across Australia and New Zealand. And the purpose of the collective is to increase capability and capacity for open publishing. And so far there have been 35 new open textbooks published by collective members since 2022. So at a national level, Western Open Books is part of a network of libraries and academic authors that are committed to open textbook publishing and making knowledge much more accessible and free. The Specific aims of Western Open Books are to firstly publish high quality online open textbooks available at no cost to students and secondly to publish open books that support the university's commitment to sustainable development. The benefits of um, open publishing for students are that all students have equal access to um, textbooks that, and that um, textbooks are free and there's a diversity of content and that it's local content. The advantages for authors of publishing with Western Open Books are again local content from a diversity of perspectives and that that is um, used in the curriculum so we're not relying on um, you know other, other sources. The other advantage is that content can be updated easily so that it remains current and relevant. There is an increased visibility for our authors internationally and it also supports collaboration between Western Sydney University researchers and researchers from around the world and this is, we think this is really, really important. So in summary, the reasons we are so committed to support open publishing include free access, customisation and diversity of content, collaboration and global accessibility. I'm now going to pass over to Lucy who's going to talk a bit more about what was involved in publishing Africa's Knowledge Bridge. Uh, thank you Fiona. I'm thrilled to announce the landmark publication of Africa's Knowledge Bridge, a collaborative effort with the Library and Western Open Books. This publication is a testament to our collective dedication to advancing knowledge pushing publishing boundaries and supporting the university's sustainable development goals. It's a moment of pride for all of us as we strive to maximise research impact and reach a wider audience. Western Open Books was established with a clear and compelling purpose to support our academics in publishing free, openly licensed textbooks for use in curricula and micro-credentials and open texts that significantly contribute to global knowledge while directly supporting the achievement of sustainable development goals. By providing free and open access to high quality research, we empower communities around the globe to address pressing challenges and drive sustainable development. Africa's Knowledge Bridge is the first open book published with Western Open Books. This open text is a comprehensive collection of freely published COVID-19 studies, specifically curated for the benefit of researchers, policymakers, healthcare professionals, public health practitioners, academics, students, and anyone interested in the socio-economic and health impacts of the pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa. The pandemic has profoundly impacted this region, and it's hoped that this resource 
will support their ongoing efforts to understand and combat pandemics effectively. This project is a beacon of hope and commitment to sharing knowledge without borders. The creation of this open book was not without its challenges. The library team meticulously ensured appropriate third-party use and licensing for around 20 published, original, originally published open access articles. This rigorous process was essential to uphold the book's integrity. To enhance accessibility, we published a web book, EPUB and PDF files, and a high-quality PDF for print version. This PDF for print makes the book suitable for use in areas with limited digital infrastructure and ensures this valuable knowledge remains accessible and usable. We work diligently to publish a free, high-quality, inclusive and accessible resource by utilising the services of external copy editing professionals to meet the highest standards of academic excellence. Peer review was not required as the articles themselves had been peer reviewed previous, uh, before they were originally published in the book. So by maximising the use of front and back matter beyond the standard acknowledgements and introductions, for example, the foreword was graciously written by Professor Rod McClure, the Dean of the School of Medicine at Western Sydney University. We have provided deeper insights and thereby enriching the book's overall value to end users. As we celebrate the launch of Africa's Knowledge Bridge, I urge all academics to embrace open access. Your participation in this movement is not just a contribution, but a vital part of a growing repository of knowledge that is freely accessible to everyone. And together, we can bridge the knowledge gaps, empower communities, and foster global academic collaboration. I extend my heartfelt thanks to each of you for your presence at the launch of Africa's Knowledge Bridge. Your support and participation are invaluable as we continue to move forward with our shared vision of making knowledge accessible to all. Our next guest speaker is Professor Ross Wilson, Director of Rural Health at Western Sydney University. Professor Wilson will be introducing this event today and sharing on its significance to Western Sydney University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wilson. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I come to you as a clinician and the Director of Rural Health at Western Sydney University. I'm sited in Bathurst where I had the pleasure of working with Levi and um, was inspired by him to speak today and I contemplated very strongly what I was going to say that would um, even reach the dizzy heights of some of the research that's gone into this book. Uh, I was so impressed and astounded really by the standard of uh, inquiry, research and application to task of all our speakers. And the thing that impressed me most was that this was a scholarly attempt to understand a most distressing pandemic. A pandemic that's divided uh, Australian states, has divided Australians uh, from each other and we've only got to witness the fact that uh, within this next week on a television show there will be a, a panel discussion with an adversarial it seems audience who virtually want to crucify those who led us through the COVID pandemic. The audience I believe has been specifically selected uh, to make it as provocative as possible and to destroy as many reputations uh, as are there. And I think this is extremely sad in this society where we don't rely on fact, research and evidence for what is said and what is brought up. And this uh, Bridging uh, Knowledge book gives us a chance to look at the evidence. It gives us a chance to contemplate the strategies that were used and how effective they were. And I think that in itself is an outstanding achievement and one which I think Western Sydney University as a whole uh, should be extremely proud of. I thank uh, Lucy for the invitation to join you this afternoon and uh, look forward to our speakers. So without further ado, I'll pass on to you, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, we can continue with the more intelligent parts of the afternoon. Thank you, Professor Wilson. A um, lot of good insights there. Our next guest speaker is Associate Professor Richard Oleron-Toba from Curtin Business School 
at Curtin University and a senior associate, associate editor of the International Journal of Physical Distribution and Logistics Management. Associate Professor Oloran Toba will be talking about the origins of the book, Africa's Knowledge Bridge. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Richard Oloran Toba. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everybody here, and I'm very, very honored to be able to join you this afternoon. I've been asked to speak by Levi about the book, um, Africa's Knowledge Bridge, but I reckon speaking about the book on its own will be incomplete without speaking about the team that wrote the book. Uh, Levi and a number of our colleagues, uh, Kingsley, uh, Tanko, are the editors, but it's a much larger group. It's a much larger group, and that's what I'm going to focus on very quickly. So at about April 2020, I was actually invited by Kingsley to collaborate on the pandemic crisis, research on the pandemic crisis. And this was uh, very interesting to me because he said this is going to be, you know, research in Africa by Africans for Africa. So that got me interested. And I said, well, let's do it. Uh, I didn't at the time know it's going to be as big as this. I thought it was just a couple of people and we just do a few surveys, but it just grew and grew. And the more and more people joined. I joined in May of 2020, and then a lot of people joined. But one of the key things that came out was the, the team cohesion. Uh, even though we were a very multicultural team, Africa is not just one big country. We have people uh, from Cameroon, from Ghana, from Kenya, from Nigeria, South Africa, Tanzania. And we had other Africans who are based in UK universities, uh, Australian universities uh, uh, as well. So there was much diversity. And most of us did not actually see each other. And we've never met before. I've only met Kingsley and Levi before. Uh, the rest of the team I have never met. But we had what was called a swift trust. Very quickly, we trusted each other and, uh, and began to, to work. I, I will say a lot of the work has been done by the colleagues who are in African institutions. Uh, I was just in a supporting role. Um, and then the name of the group where was, uh, was, was, was called, uh, is still called African Translational Research Group, ATREC, which captured the essence of the group. And the essence of the group was actually to undertake multidisciplinary research uh, and bring a lot of multidisciplinary expertise uh, to the pandemic crisis in an African context. Uh, so we had colleagues from optometry, from public health, of course, epidemiology, computer science, nutrition, uh, and myself also from, uh, from management and the social sciences. So it was a fantastic effort and uh, it's been very productive. And what has been the outcome of the group? Apart from this book, uh, African Knowledge Bridge, they, within a spate of two or three years, the group was able to get a grant in Nigeria, uh, which was worth about 50,000 US dollars. Uh, the group was able to publish more than 16 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, they were also able to present in about three conferences, and they also published uh, a number of articles in the conversation. Uh, the conversation for Africa and the conversation for Australia. So I think that's a very good productive group uh, within the short time uh, the group uh, has been together. Uh, in terms of the dynamics, I think the key thing that ensured the success of the group was respect. The group, even without knowing each other, without any kinship, uh, everybody came from different countries, different language, different background different disciplines, but everybody respected each other. Everybody was open. There was inclusion. There was fairness. There was good and candid communication. And everything was done online. It, nobody met anybody. Everything that was achieved was achieved using WhatsApp, emails, Zoom, 
So that's very, very inspiring that uh, without meeting people, you can still collaborate and be productive. Also, the team had no formal structure. Uh, we had uh, Levi who acted as a coordinator, contacting people, and all the meetings were held during the weekends. It was all on Saturdays and Sundays. So the group members were very committed. They were working on Saturdays, Sundays, and everybody just did whatever needed to be done. If there was any piece of writing to be done, somebody would volunteer and do it. If there was uh, any review to be done, somebody would volunteer. And everything was done on a very voluntary basis. There was no formal organization. Uh, so that, I think, was very fantastic, given the, the, the different perspectives everybody bought and the differences in culture, in language. The team actually gelled, and I think there is a lot of lessons for us to learn uh, in collaborative research online and in person. So I will refer everybody to look at the publication that the group published on international research collaboration during the pandemic crisis, team formation, team challenges, strategies, and achievements. Uh, it's a peer review publication that captures the details of the group dynamics. Uh, so this book, Africa's Knowledge Bridge, is just one outcome out of a series of uh, tasks and, and work that has been done. So thank you very much, and I'm very honored to be here, and I'm happy that uh, we've all learned and uh, we've, we will also be learning even more. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, those insights into um, the, the team effort in getting this book published. It's, it's just wonderful to hear. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that, Richard. Uh, let's move on to the um, keynote speakers who will be offering their special insights into public health compliance and strategies to combat future pandemics. Our first keynote speaker is Dr. James Kojo Pra. Director of Health Services at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Dr. Pra, would you please give us your insights into mental health, demographic disparities, vaccine perceptions, and public health compliance during and after the pandemic? I'm grateful to join us as a public health physician and a lead in, the, in, leading, in leading the plan, the pandemic in this country, especially in Cape Coast, where the University of Cape Coast is located, and also leading the combat among staff and students of the university. I learned many things and I'm very happy many of these have been recorded in the book as University of Cape Coast had also participated in this publication. So I want to begin with the mental health effects. Ghanaians, like many others, global yes experienced many mental health issues during the pandemic. This range from the thoughts of having a positive report after a COVID quarantine and even having close relations and friends infected. I can recall when students are screened and as they await their results, what they go through, you get many calls. Are my results in? Is it, was it positive, negative? students really experience. For us as health workers, we face a lot of stigma and discrimination. There were a lot of social rejection and sometimes even verbal attacks because many people who, 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 who unfortunately have to relate to them positive COVID results didn't slash up now, but so somebody lost their livelihoods during the quarantine period. Many suffered hunger and were deprived of basic being quarantined or isolated. How that affected their families and dependents. It was so severe that many became depressed. A few even developed panic attacks. Some groups of people were particularly at risk of stigma. I've mentioned health workers, others included people who have recovered from COVID-19, suspected persons with COVID-19, and even people with travel histories from COVID-19 hotspots countries. In the hospital, 
we health workers were actually stretched to elastic limits with the number of patients reporting to the hospitals for care. The thought of possibly being infected by a patient also weighed heavily on our minds as we took care of the sick. Seeing colleagues and many others die from COVID-19 was a mental torture to many of us. In my hospital for instance, anxiety alone led to many of my colleagues agitating by of the hospital for a period. Among the demographic disparities, age, sex, and social status were the main demographic variables that displayed significant disparities in many of the studies that were conducted, and some have been recorded in the book that we are launching today. Males were more at risk of severe infection compared to females. And the elderly also suffered from severe disease compared to other age groups. People of low socioeconomic status and from some particular regions in Ghana were both at risk. For instance, residences in heavily populated regions like the Greater Accra region and Ashanti region were most affected. With regards to vaccine perceptions, the initial vaccine perception among many Ghanaians was that of suspicion. Many fell for conspiracy theories and social media propaganda portraying the vaccines as very dangerous and were prepared with ulterior motives. However, with time, many began to have some trust in the vaccine after noticing the very low rate of vaccine-related deaths and other morbidities among those who had briefly taken the vaccine. Vaccine uptake therefore increased and rose to a point when in somewhere around April 2023, the rate of vaccination uptake among Ghanaians was about 30%. After the pandemic, the vaccine uptake had actually slowed down and the desire of many to take the vaccine had reduced, possibly because now people are no more afraid of what the, what the pandemic actually brought. On public health compliance during and after the pandemic, many hesitated to adhere to the protocols at the beginning of the pandemic. However, at a point in time, uh, the authorities had to apply force to ensure people wore, for instance, the face masks. However, as the pandemic peak, compliance improved as people became more and more afraid of the high rate of death and sickness being recorded. There were unforeseen facilities almost everywhere we went, and most were mandatory to use, especially in public places. Over time, as things improved, people began to relax again regarding the compliance with protocols. Currently, most hand washing facilities in public places have disappeared. However, we hope that many lessons that have been learned from what the pandemic brought will go a long way to improve public health services and get ourselves ready Thanks. if there should be another. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pra, for those valuable insights. Our next keynote speaker is Professor Hayward Mapuye, former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Jos in Nigeria. Dr. Mapuye, would you please advise on what the most effective public health measures implemented in your country have been to combat the spread of COVID-19 and how these strategies can be adapted for future pandemics? Uh, so thank you very much for the honor to make this contribution uh, on this occasion. Um, yes, with respect to the most effective public health measures that Nigeria implemented to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and also how these strategies can be adopted for future pandemics, I would have to say that uh, a lot of the public health measures were thus advised by the WHO and uh, accepted by the country within our own local context. So uh, basically, uh, mask wearing was mandated, and this was to uh, help reduce the spread of the disease by uh, droplets. 
and uh, it was most effective for public gatherings, uh, whether they are weddings or they are they are ceremonies. It was mandated, and then also we had social distancing. This was also another that was uh, effective measure that was mandated, but the observance of compliance was more at uh, order controls where you had to uh, observe that. And then uh, typically it was about two meters between uh, persons in a queue, and uh, it was in most cases the way it, it held uh, successful. Then the issue of uh, hand hygiene and um, the use of hand sanitizer were also widely used and it brought out the best in Nigerians, uh, young people innovations that uh, they would make local products of uh, the requirement that they needed to have 60% alcohol in the, in the product and uh, it helped quite a bit. And then of course uh, testing and contact tracing for individuals that had symptoms or who had come uh, in contact with persons that were uh, already known to have had the infection. That was also something that was practiced and, uh, uh, and, and it helped. Then the quarantine and isolation was also um, enforced, particularly for the fact that uh, some persons were not yet symptomatic, but of course uh, needed some isolation once they were confirmed to be infected to prevent further spread. Now, on travel restrictions and border controls, I think they already said that uh, travel was limited, but that was more effective for the international travel because it was easier to do that at the, the ports of entry and exits from the country. Vaccination, as my colleague from Ghana has said, initially there was some kind of hesitancy but uh, I think the fear of death meant that many people had to change their minds and, and uh, accept it. Uh, and then again, public health communication, the social me media messaging was quite positive uh, on what needed to be done to prevent infections and transmission risks. Ventilation and indoor air quality uh, systems and promotion of uh, outdoor activities were also um, in, in practice or in, in enforced. Public gatherings and restrictions were temporarily limited or adjusted so that um, you couldn't meet for large uh, groups. And even when you met as small groups, you have to still observe some kind of uh, distance. Now, what, what uh, strategies have these uh, uh, measures in our now uh, led us to prepare for future uh, pandemics. So um, there's this early detection and surveillance that uh, is, is in, in focus to detect outbreaks and including uh, following the, the detection and then of course a robust uh, monitoring system to ensure that uh, the surveillance uh, is really effective and then also attempts to sequence the genomes of the virus. As you know, during the pandemic, there was this constant mutation from Delta to all sorts of things and we needed to have capacity and laboratories to be able to uh, sequence and be able to monitor our surveillance system. Then rapid response preparedness also meant that uh, the country has now benefit from this experience to have public protective um, uh, equipment in stock and other therapeutics and not have to wait until there is an outbreak before we start our uh, country around to do uh, needful. Then the issue of vaccine development and deployment, uh, you would see that um, now the, the regulatory structures for that are in place and the government have made efforts to provide some funding so that um, uh, some research can go on to sequencing the readiness to produce the candidate vaccines uh, for, for clinical trials. Of course, that would have to include international collaborations that will have to be made to share data among countries and, and scientists in different countries 
And I think what has happened with this uh, African Translational Research Group is that already we see how this can work very effectively in bringing together a rapid multidisciplinary group uh, with a, a whole full, nearly full complement of all that is required to fight this kind of pandemic. So I do hope that this, the country will be able to be better prepared in future pandemics. Of course, the issues of behavior and cultural adaptation uh, lessons that have been learned so that we can uh, uh, do better. You know, those cultural, social, economic um, impediments would have to be worked up to convince people to uh, you know, drop any kind of hesitancy or resistance to uh, any pandemics should those uh, arise. We know that in some countries they were mandated, and if they are mandated, then you have to comply. And then the flexible uh, response strategies uh, would have to be developed and strategized to scale up or scale down the severity and spread of outbreaks, and that would include targeting quarantine measures travel restrictions, and adaptive healthcare protocols. Research and development, obviously, to um, find candidate therapeutics, diagnostics, and other preventive uh, measures, including um, uh, anthropological practices and, and behaviors that would um, help to um, mitigate the spread of any pandemics would have to be put in place. With that said, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, our final keynote speaker is uh, Dr. John Oladejo, Oladejo, Director of Special Duties in the Office of the Director General, Nigeria Centre for Disease Control. If you could share with us your strategies for your country has adopted to mitigate against future occurrences of such pandemics. Um, they were one of uh, one of the major things that happened during the, uh, COVID nineteen because I was the incident manager. And so we had the first uh, case was to uh, have a very strong uh, technical working group uh, with the leadership at that time and uh, the very strong uh, political will from the presidency. So the first thing we did was to expand molecular and approach network. Uh, we had only five at that time. So we had to establish in all the 30, so 36 states plus FCT uh, um, uh, in, in the country, and that is one of the, the strategies we are adopting now. We are now going from the public to some of the private, because at, at the time we had uh, COVID-19, we were only concentrating on the uh, public um, uh, services from one state to the other, but now we are now moving to uh, private because we realize that most of the people um, in the rural area, even at the urban level, they go to the uh, private uh, facilities. So we really need... Another thing we did was um, having the emergency preparedness and response from uh, 29 states to all the states of the Federation so that we're able to coordinate all the activities. And we now established uh, public health emergency operation centers in all the states as a strategy to ensure that uh, or we prevent and even and detect any uh, epidemic outbreak or even pandemic. And another thing we we did was training on protecting health workers all over the uh, country. So we had initially about ten thousand. So we had to increase the IPC training to forty thousand. And then uh, we also look at um, research and development. We realized that uh, we really needed to do a lot of researches. So during the period of a uh, uh, pandemic, at least we produced about 21 paper, uh, which was very, very useful. And then we were able to uh, uh, use it for a policy uh, implementation. So we now have a consortium of uh, uh, research and development for the country. Uh, you know, in, uh, in, in uh, collaboration with the CEPI, now we are uh, that as much as possible to produce uh, vaccines for Nasa people. We all know that Nasa people have been in the system for the past uh, 50 years, and we have never had a single uh, dose of a, a vaccine. So 
this time around, we are developing it and it's now on the uh, second uh, stage. Another area uh, we are uh, doing to mitigate future occurrence is uh, strengthening the public health um, uh, and emergency ambulance. You know, initially it was only at the uh, very populated um, states where we're having the ambulances, but now we are trying as much as possible to establish and move to other uh, corridors where we believe that uh, this outbreak may occur and we may not be able to uh, capture it. So we are getting ambulances, services, uh, emergency medical teams to all these areas so that uh, we'll be able to mitigate any future occurrence of other epidemics or pandemic. Another area we are actually looking at is a partnership and uh, support innovation. So we have group of uh, uh, partners that are supporting us you know, in terms of uh, uh, equitable access to health resources and uh, you know, building the trust between government and public. Because if that one is not well established, you know, people uh, may not be able to listen to government, even when they're giving them a very simple instruction. So we are really, you know, struggling very hard to ensure that we build a very uh, strong trust between government and the, and the populace. Then, you know, when we first started initially, there was weak coordination, and then we had to, you know, work on this to make sure that uh, we have a very strong coordination effort among all the stakeholders. So uh, every every two, two months, the Honorable Minister meets all the uh, stakeholders in, uh, in the exit sector. The last one we had was uh, uh, two days ago, where we established what we call primary, I mean, basic uh, health care uh, provisional fund where uh, uh, about 5% of that fund is actually, you know, donated to any outbreak of uh, uh, intervention. So um, we are equally dealing with uh, insufficient human resources capacity, and this is uh, an area where our own minister really have interest in because to really deal with uh, air security, we really need to work on this. So we... Um, we have what we call the epidemiology and ability network uh, uh, program where we train uh, our state, uh, our epidemiologists, the epidemiologists, as well as uh, the surveillance officers so that they will be able to uh, go ahead to only detect and then respond accordingly. They were using 717 matches approach to where within the seven days of any uh, outbreak, you're able to detect it and within the Post 24 hours, we should be able to report to the IS authority and within seven days uh, be able to respond accordingly. So these are the measures uh, we are uh, putting in place, government is putting in place, even at our own uh, level, which we're actually working on to ensure that uh, we um, mitigate against any future occurrence. So thank you very much and over. Okay. Thank you very much for those for those insights on on the strategies in your country. So, um, big thank you to all our keynote speakers. So, we're moving on to the next session, as, which is the panel discussions with authors and experts, and we'll be calling on Professor Mafoye to uh, to have a think about uh, some of these panel questions. Um, in, in in addition, the library received lots of great questions for this event during registration. And we'll now share these with the panellists for their insights and uh, for the recommendations. So um, the first topic, uh, can you discuss any notable collaborations between uh, local and inter international research institutions? Just wondering if, the, if one of the panellists would like to talk to that. Uh, Professor Mafia, yeah, would, you. would you like to talk about that? Let me just proceed with that. Um, Basically, the advantages that came out of the experience of the unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic that uh, a number of uh, collaborations uh, came to light between local and international research institutions. Uh, reference has been made now to the African Translation Research Group. I think it's a positive one. And you have seen that how uh, researchers from English-speaking and French-speaking countries in sub-Saharan Africa came together and have given us this very uh, 
data, much needed data. Like we are now better placed to, to do that. I would hope that it goes beyond uh, this kind of online research. Uh, I think Olon Trevor alluded to that when he said he needed to see in-person meetings. So there can be collaborations between the institutions, the scientists in the different laboratories, the different countries, and I hope it will be a perfect demonstration of a South-South collaboration. Um, again, um, the African Center of Excellence in Phytomedicine Research and Development at the University of Jobs during the COVID period uh, did the fit to tap on indigenous knowledge, uh, looking at what the herbal traditional medicine practitioners were using as antimicrobials to treat diseases. They now have to screen 13 uh, plants, and then out of the 13 plants, they got uh, 25 um, phytochemicals, of which further uh, standard screening yielded six candidate products that uh, are, are for, for, for therapeutics. And I think that that is one uh, particular outcome of uh, research. And then there was the DNA, uh, COVID-19 DNA vaccine candidate uh, developed in Nigeria between the three universities, basically, or four institutions. The, the Usman Udanfode University in Sokoto in the northwest of the country, the University of Jos in central or middle belt of Nigeria, and then we had the, the National Veterinary Research Institute, an institute that has a long history of vaccine development, uh, dating back to nearly 100 years, for in the face of cattle and other diseases was also in the center of this. And the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research came together and produced the candidate uh, vaccine product that is now ready for clinical trials. Of course, you would also know that um, uh, another institution in the southwest of Nigeria the, at the Redeemers University, the African Center of Excellence in Genomic uh, Infectious Diseases, working with the Broad Institute and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in the United States, have also sequenced the COVID-19 genome. I happen to have been at Harvard as a Dikemi Fellow for 11 months, and I participated at meetings in the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and I know what exactly goes there, even though my time there was on malaria and not on COVID-19. Thank you for your That's contributions fine. so far. I, I yield back. Yield back. Thank you. So our second topic is Based on current research findings, how can the region be better prepared for future pandemics? Uh, Dr. Aliche, would you like to respond to this question? Well, it appears that uh, Dr. Aliche is not here. Um, would anyone else like to add or speak to this? Okay. I can, hello, I can oh. say, I don't know who are the panel members, but I can say a few words about the topic too. Sure. I uh, think uh, yeah. epidemic preparedness, this is David Doku, uh, a professor in epidemiology and public health from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. I think uh, preparedness is very key uh, to be able to face the next pandemic if it occurs. And one of the key issues is collaboration. Collaboration in Africa. We must collaborate uh, across boundaries and across uh, language barriers. Uh, in West Africa, for example, we have Anglophone and Francophone. We should be able to work together to be able to uh, arrest any situation that arises. We should strengthen our research capacity. Research capacity, we should be able to uh, model and predict uh, yeah. a, a possible uh, now casting and forecasting uh, during the epidemic, if it were care, we should be able to strengthen our institutions, the healthcare system, uh, data availability and integration. Uh, currently, the issue about the environmental and health data uh, availability and integration is very, very key for us to be able to understand um, the threats that climate change, for example, uh, poses to uh, emergence and re-emergence of infectious diseases. So collaboration is key. Capacity building and research, uh, cutting edge research is key. And then integration of data uh, to be able to understand the situation 
and then more importantly, information sharing across across the the region is very key. So I think these are some of the few things that we can do to prepare for the next pandemic, if if it occurs. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. So our third topic asks whether there is a data comparison between low-income countries and high-income countries. Uh, Associate Professor Epignol, would you like to respond to this question? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Yeah, our study um, did not directly compare between low-income countries and high-income countries. However, we looked at, we compared um, the risk of perception of COVID-19 among sub-Saharan Africans in local and diaspora residents. That's Africans that live in Africa and Africans that live outside Africa. So we found that there was no significant difference in the mean risk perception scores between the two groups, which means that the high risk perception scores among residents living in sub-Saharan Africa and those in the diaspora were comparable and were also associated with an increase in knowledge of COVID-19 and positive attitude towards the control of COVID-19. In other words, knowledge and attitude scores increase at perceived risk for COVID-19 in case for both groups. We also, in another study, we compared acceptance of COVID-19 vaccine among sub-Saharan African in local and diaspora residents. We looked at uptake, hesitancy, and resistance to COVID-19 between both groups, that's Africans that live in Africa and Africans that live outside Africa. Most of the respondents were from um, United States, live in the United Kingdom, United States of America, and Australia. The results showed that the uptake of vaccine was more among diaspora residents than among local residents. In fact, it was twice as high. According to uh, WHO and the uh, Center for Disease Control, this may be due to the inequitable distribution of vaccine in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. And also there was vaccine accessibility issues in sub-Saharan Africa during the period. Also, Africans in diaspora were less likely to be hesitant or resistant to vaccine as compared to their counterparts residing in Africa. This may be related to misinformation. The subgroup most affected were the, um, in those in um, the younger age group, the lower, uh, those with low level of education. So we also recommended that um, the communication and education strategies the ads, should be designed to promote the adoption of preventive measures among sub-Saharan Africans, and that those messages should be relayed in the languages familiar to the people to increase their knowledge. And the target group found in this study with low perception risk should be emphasized. That is the unemployed, the young population, and those with lower level of education and non-healthcare workers. More information about all of these are in the book. We um, I employ you to create the time to read this for more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ekwin Young. Our fourth topic asks, how can this book be cascaded to learning institutions in rural areas in Africa without compromising on the quality of the contents? Professor Imvulada, would you like to respond to this question? Yes, um, thank you very much. I would like to begin by mentioning that um, the situation in, differ in the African countries would differ though we are all Africans, but there are some differences, um, as alluded by uh, Professor Richard when he was giving his speech, I mean his presentation. Now, um, that tells us that um, we'll have to adopt different approaches in cascading this book to reach as many audience as possible for them to access this book. Um, in different institutions, the, the situation will also be different. There are some tertiary institutions that have access to e-libraries. So um, for the institutions who have um, the e-libraries, um, I would say that if this book will be available in their catalog, it will be very beneficial. 
so that both students, staff, and even the general population can have access to this book. And that will, in, that will greatly improve the learning. Um, for this book to also get to some of these institutions, um, if it is available in databases um, where Africans can access it either free or in very, very subsidized um, um, cost, that will also help in ensuring that they, they get access to, this, um, to these books. There are also some um, um, sites where free books can be available, are usually available. And there are some organizations that also um, serve as hubs where distribution of such books uh, are being made. Now, our knowledge of internet is um, quite impressive. Students have access to Android phones and, and so on. So they can access these books through these um, free sites where the books are available for them. But not overlooking the challenges that we have in Africa um, in terms of um, electricity, uh, power, and in terms of access to internet, we know that um, we cannot uh, completely rely on the e-copies of the books. So the print copies will also be um, an advantage, very added advantage to our own um, community, especially communities in the rural areas in Africa. So but getting these books um, across to them will mean that um, either the institutions will purchase those books for them, if possible, or where non-governmental organizations or even the countries can commit to purchasing these books or getting these books either free so that they can actually put them in the shelves of all the, the libraries. Um, the libraries, um, apart from the ones in the institutions, will also have some public libraries around. If this is um, found in their shelves, I think that will also help in ensuring that we all get, um, they get access to this, uh, this book. Thank you and over. Thank you for that. Okay, so our next topic is for the editors, uh, Associate Professor Kingsley Yager and Dr. Uche Ukwu Levi Osu Agwu. How long did it take to publish the book and what were the most challenging issues? Uh, Professor Agar, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. One of the first challenging issues was funding. Uh, I could remember vividly that in 2022, we did talk to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Jeff that we wanted to write a book about the papers we published. And then it was good to talk to the, the head of uh, Ted Fund in Nigeria. Ted Fund is one of the, just like NHMRC in Australia, one of the high uh, that provide funding. Uh, to researchers in Nigeria, but uh, uh, unfortunately, um, things didn't work because the head of Tefal was re removed. One of the other challenges we have with the book is the getting the articles to flow. As Professor uh, Richard Rotovas mentioned, we are from different field of specialization. For example, we have papers on MIC, looking at you know, 5G, and we have papers on misinformation, and we have publications on mental health, and things like that. So getting these papers to flow was a big, big challenge. Another major challenge is the title. See, where we thought that was quite challenging in the sense that we have to title the book because Western Sydney is committed to the Sustainable Development Goal. So we have to look at various sustainable development goals. Based on that, we're able to title the book. One of them is, you know, uh, SGD4, which talks about the quality education, you know, which is quite important. Another one that was very important is to reduce inequality. We know that if you give this book to people in Africa, that inequality between developed and less developed countries is being reduced. Another key challenges we have in the book is the issue of defining some of the terminology. Like, for example, not everyone is an epidemiology. Like, we use the word odd ratios. I'm sure not everybody here understands what is odd ratio. To a lay person out there, they don't know odd ratio. So we need, we went and redefined this definition in such a way that somebody of, somebody not familiar with the word odd ratio can understand it and be able to make meaningful uh, meanings of that. 
other big challenges again we have with the book is the issue of copyright. As Professor Lotoba has said, we have about 20 publications. Lucy, Lilia, Frank have to write to all these uh, <clears throat> publishers to get permission from them to make sure these books are valuable online to people living in Africa. That was a very big challenge, a big task to do to write to each and every one of them. Another key is to get the appropriate person to write the forward notes. So that was a very big challenge. So we finally got on the uh, the current dean of medicine at Western Sydney, Professor Rod McKeel. And Rod has got experience in Africa. He Rod did work for the Center for Clinic for Center for Disease and Control and Prevention in US, USA. So because of his experience, we were able to get Rod to contribute to the the forward of the book. Another major challenge is, is having meetings with the librarian team. You know, Lucy, Lily, Jeffrey, we're done, guys. Sometimes we have midnight discussions, Zoom meeting constantly, sometimes off hours. So that was another uh, big uh, challenge. <laughs> another major challenge, as Professor Lotoba said, is authorship. Initially, Levo and I were the authors on the paper because this thing was you know, engineered by Western Sydney, but having we 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 have a series of meetings and consultation with the group, then based on their recommendations, we now added more photos. Again, referencing was in was a nightmare because we have, you know, twenty or sixteen different books and the station whereby we have references, you know, try to put these references together was a nightmare you have the issue of cross referencing between articles. Another key thing is we need to is is we leaving out some of um, some um, unpublished papers. We we find that very very challenging because we felt you know these are very useful articles that can change policies and practices, but because it wasn't published, we have to leave them out. So another uh, thing we need to also talk about is to get the the the, the right date for the launch of the book. Which was quite challenging because you know we have to do it on a on a Saturday. You know, for some of us that live in developed countries, Saturdays are days you want to be with your family. You don't want to chill out after a long day uh, work from Monday to Friday. But for some of us who live in in you know in Africa, Saturday is quite the best thing we have. To, and a lot of people in our group are senior management in the university, so most of the time they have meetings from Monday to Friday. And we all agree that Saturday was the best time for us to uh, have this meeting. And finally, is getting the, our guest to speak today. It was a major, major uh, challenge to get somebody. We have to identify somebody who has a very huge knowledge in public health, in, in particular in in not communic in, in communicable. Uh, epidemiology. So we, we we carefully contacted people and we selected these people to come and have a talk today. That's it for me. Uh, and I'll pass it back to you, Jeff. Thoughts? Well, our next topic is how will Sub-Saharan Africa sustain the gain from the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure sustainable health security in the region? Dr. Ovinsar Ogbomo, would you like to respond to this question? Yes, thank you, Jeff, for the opportunity. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic presented South South Africa with uh, unprecedented challenges. It also uh, catalyzed significant advancements in health systems and public health strategies. So to sustain these gains and ensure sustainable health security, the region must focus on several key areas, uh, such as uh, strengthening health systems, enhancing disease surveillance, investing in healthcare infrastructure, fostering regional cooperation, and addressing social determinants. I'll just really go through each of these points in the five minutes that I have to speak to this topic. Well, one of the most critical lessons from the pandemic is the importance of resilient health systems. South South Africa must continue to build on the progress made in improving healthcare delivery. This includes increasing funding for health services, 
training healthcare workers, and ensuring the availability of essential medicines and equipment. Strengthening primary healthcare systems is particularly vital as they are the first line of defense against health emergencies. So by investing in robust health systems, the region can better manage future pandemics and other health crises. Uh, uh, effective disease surveillance is also a crucial, uh, is, is crucial for early detection and response to health threats. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa improved their surveillance systems, including the use of digital tools for tracking and reporting cases. To sustain these gains, therefore, it is essential to continue to invest in advanced, and sur in advanced surveillance technologies and training personnel in epidemiology and data analysis, strengthening laboratory networks, and ensuring timely sharing of information across borders will also enhance the region's ability to respond to uh, outbreaks very swiftly. The pandemic also highlighted the need for adequate healthcare infrastructure, including hospitals, clinics, and laboratories. Sub-Saharan Africa most prioritized the construction and maintenance of healthcare facilities, particularly in rural and other served areas. Additionally, investing in telemedicine and mobile health technologies can help bridge the gap in healthcare access, following allowing uh, more people to receive timely medical care. Governments and international partners should collaborate to secure uh, funding and technical support for these initiatives. Uh, regional cooperation is also essential for addressing health security challenges that transcend national borders. The African Union and regional bodies such as the West African Health Organization and the East African Community have played pivotal roles during the pandemic. Strengthening these institutions and promoting collaboration among member states can enhance the region's collective response to health emergencies. Joint efforts in research such as what we have done in uh, Africa Research Group uh, resource sharing and capacity building will be crit crucial for sustaining the gains made during the pandemic. Addressing social determinants of health, uh, health security is not solely dependent on healthcare system. It is influenced by social determinants such as poverty, education, housing. The pandemic unfortunately accentuated the existing social inequalities highlighting the need for comprehensive strategies to address these underlying factors. Government must continue to implement policies that promote economic development, improve living conditions, and ensure access to education and clean water. By tackling these social determinants, South South African countries can continue to create a healthier and more resilient uh, population. So in conclusion, sustaining the gains for the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuring sustainable health security in South Southern Africa requires a multifaceted approach, strengthening health systems, enhancing disease surveillance, investing in healthcare infrastructure, fostering regional cooperation, and addressing social determinants of health are all critical uh, components for this strategy. By building on the progress made during the pandemic and continuing to innovate and collaborate, South Southern African countries can achieve lasting health security and improve the well-being of its people. Uh, yield back. Um, but thank you very much for that, um, Professor Avanseri. Uh, we're going to move now um, to the Q&A session. Uh, so I'd like to thank the guest speakers and panellists for their critical insights and recommendations for future public health strategies. Um, we'll now, uh, if, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself, if you wish to ask any questions um, of the guest speakers and panellists, uh, you are welcome to. Thank you. But for the for the panelists and guest speakers, while we're just waiting for people to think of a question, um, we've got um, a question that came in during registration: um, whether there is a new variant of COVID nineteen virus spreading in sub-Saharan Africa. Would any of the authors or experts like to respond? Yeah, let's see. We've got somebody from from the Nigerian uh, Center for Disease Control here. I think they will be quite. Uh, you know, upfront with that information if he is able to respond. Well, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, there was a particular time uh, there was a rumor that uh, there was a new um, uh, 
the new genome of uh, the virus, you know, in the um, African region. But all our efforts to actually track um, our POE because we actually wanted our POE. POE is a, um, um, the port of entry. That is all the international um, airports as well as, as well as the seaport and even uh, all the land uh, borders. So those are the areas where we actually wanted. So, you know, after several weeks and uh, uh, several months, we couldn't uh, find any new strain as it was uh, actually rumored that time. But we were told that some countries, but not in the African uh, region, were actually recording a new species. So that is uh, what I can say about it. So that was the reason why we now move it from level three of the PHOC, and since the public emergency management level three to level one. So we are trying to make it as uh, as one of the uh, IDSR uh, disease surveillance, uh, uh, routine surveillance. Notwithstanding, we still report if there's any um, um, any suspected cases of uh, um, uh, uh, COVID-19. But we have not really had any in the last uh, uh, one or, or two months as I speak now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got another question from chat. Do you need more funding? It's always a nice question to be asked. Yeah, is that question to the group or, or to the audience? Uh, this was from the audience to the uh, group. Yeah, we, we, we definitely do. Uh, you could see how uh, what the challenges were, which uh, Kingsley did enumerate as well, and Richard did allude to that. Uh, this was all done without funding. There was no funding from anywhere that we got during this period. The third fund, uh, funding came much later for uh, for a different project looking at frontline health workers in Nigeria. So we do we do need funding. That really dropped us a bit in our pursuit. It could have been more papers than this and maybe more grant work, more field data collection. So those were the things that we couldn't undertake because you need more money to be able to do those. So I think the answer is yes. And if we get any leads to that, we'll be quite, quite happy to pursue that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask a question of uh, Rod McClure? Uh, I believe he's potentially in the audience. Uh, we've got a question about um, whether your advice uh, for Africa, having worked with the Australian government to combat the pandemic, have you got any advice on that? Sorry, I just got my camera focus. Yeah, um, yeah it's a big, a big question, and giving advice from from somewhere else is always a little bit fraught. <laughs> um, I, I've noticed that Africa has a very powerful community-based influence and uh, in Australia it might be easier to go straight to the, the policy or the, the person who's to the decision maker in the work that I've done in Africa the power of the of the communities seems to me to be a very convincing constituency so uh, the community engagement work that's been demonstrated in this book the bottom-up approach the development approach I guess it's a top-down bottom-up it's trying to find a way that that conversation moves into the spheres where there's some critical mass and resources, but the resources themselves won't work without the community behind it. So I guess what I'm saying is really to reinforce the message of the book uh, rather than come in with a new idea. Um, the ideas, I think, are in the book, and they are very, very powerful. And uh, I think experience has shown how strong some of the solutions that come bottom up this way have been, as long as the, the communication is strong. And I guess the book is all about developing that communication Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got another question uh, for Professor Mafuye and Dr. Oladero, Oladejo. Um, are you able to comment on the current cholera epidemic in Nigeria? Hello, I didn't get it. Oh, oh, are, you, oh. are you able to comment on the current cholera epidemic in Nigeria? Oh, okay. Yes. So, um, uh, yes. So uh, we realized that. Uh, uh, most of the um, areas where this cholera were, were 
cases were actually Kobe. Uh, people were not reporting it. We actually advocated for several one seven matrix. Uh, that is, within seven days, you should be able to uh, uh, detect the, the the outbreak. And within 24 hours, you should be able to you know, send a report to the authority, which we did not get in time. And then within uh, seven days, we should be able to uh, uh, respond. So we now have active states, you know, recording um, cholera. So we quickly, you know, had, had to activate AOC. Uh, that is a, a emergency operation center. And then we place it on uh, uh, level three just to mobilize everyone. So we had meetings with all our stakeholders and then we deploy our rapid response team. Uh, to the states to do that uh, they will be able to give them technical support and uh, uh, within a very short period of time the number of uh, new cases that were being reported is now coming down gradually and then we hope that in the next two or three days you know it will normalize you know it has happened before you know in 2017 when we had a uh, fabric of uh, CSM you know we were having more than 2,500 new cases every week immediately we set up our EOC that time it reduced to 300 cases. And within a very short period of time, we had to close, uh, we had to declare the outbreak uh, uh, over. And the same thing is going to happen now. So um, uh, the number of cases has gradually re reducing as we uh, sent our rapid response team to the state. And then we position some of the drugs for them. And then they are working in conjunction with the uh, states epidemiologists as well as uh, surveillance officers at the uh, state level and they are engaging the community especially the um uh, the uh, community leaders as well as the traditional leaders there and then uh, we are working with the uh, federal ministry of uh, water resources to be able to get at least a clean water for them at uh, at the grassroots level. The reason why we're having it was just because of the event that I just started and then they were drinking very contaminated uh, water. So all these things with our wash pillar as well as our, as our, our IPC pillar, Invention Prevention and Control, we were actually getting to the grassroots and then getting to the deep uh, uh, situation of the, uh, of the outbreak. So that is in, in, in a nutshell, that's the situation we have now. Thank right. you very much. Th thank you very much for that. Um, well, um, that we with that we come to the end of the session. Um, I'd like to now now focus on the actual book itself. Um, it's now been um, officially published and available online. So please use the DOI link on the slide. Uh, to access the book from the Western Open Books catalogue. Um, the, as the session's being recorded, you'll be able to, to grab that link. Um, and if you'd like to download the PDF, the print version, or access the data sets that come with the book, uh, click the link on this slide, uh, which will take you to the book record in our institutional repository, uh, Research Direct. There you'll find a link to download the print version. So we've come to the end, as mentioned, we've come to the end of this event. Uh, for anyone um, who didn't get a chance to have their questions responded to, um, if you use that, if you scan that QR code, as well as uh, providing feedback to help us improve future book launch events, you'll be able to add some questions there or be asked if you, uh, if you want some, uh, if you want to be uh, contacted to discuss any of these topics, uh, please leave your details in the uh, survey form. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank our special guests, uh, panellists and our audience for attending today's event and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you also to Jeff for co-hosting with me and thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lisa. Thank you very That's much. That's all right. Thank you very much, right. everyone. Okay. Have a good day. Good evening. Bye-bye.